Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Jimenez and family and church family here for inviting me out. Again, it's been a while since I've been out here, but um, it's great to be here and I appreciate all the hospitality and, and all the friends. It's good seeing the, the old faces and the new faces I hope to see again in another decade, uh, saying hi and, and, uh, and seeing how everyone's doing. So appreciate you uh, uh, inviting me to preach this evening. Now, uh, hopefully if you came uh, to the Red Hot Preaching Conference, you didn't expect it to be cold, right? I mean, it's a, it's a Red Hot Preaching Conference. Hopefully the preaching will be getting you a little bit uncomfortable, but you know, if the preaching fails, at least you're going to be physically a little, a little uncomfortable because uh, you, you did attend the Red Hot. So that's the end of my jokes. I'm not like Pastor Mejia or some of these other guys <laughs> that, uh, that, are, that are really good at, at um, providing that type of amusement. Um, Tonight, what I've got prepared is more like a Bible study. We're going to be spending a lot of time in Numbers chapter 5 going over this story of the jealousy offering. So when we switch to other chapters, just make sure you put a bookmark here in Numbers chapter 5 because we're going to be coming back to this quite a bit. We're going to start reading here. Look down in your Bibles right at the very beginning there. In verse number 11, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside... And commit a trespass offering, excuse me, commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept close, and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the manner. Now, this is a, a very unique story. Many of you might have, have read over this passage and kind of wonder, like it's 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 very unique, it's very different. Uh, it's it, it's also unique because it's not even found in like Deuteronomy or in Exodus, we see it here in Numbers, and it's a specific situation that takes place um, between a man and, and, and his wife, where you have a woman where the husband is thinking that she might be, he's suspicious of her, he becomes jealous thinking that she might have gone and been with another man. But there's no proof of this, there's no witnesses, she hasn't been caught in the act, there's nobody to say, hey, I saw this person, you know, these two people go together and it's kind of kept under wraps. So there's no way of knowing for certain that she was unfaithful, which means there's, there's no way of being convicted of adultery. And of course, in the Bible, the, the committing the act of adultery was guilty of the death penalty. So it's very serious, and in order to be convicted of something like that, you had to have at least two witnesses in order for someone to be put to death. And obviously there's situations like this where if the woman is complicit, isn't gonna wanna be caught, isn't gonna wanna be found out committing adultery because they know they'd be put to death, but if, if there's no way of dealing with that, there still is a way of dealing with this uh, within a marriage. Now, the Bible says there in verse number 14 of Numbers 5, And the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled. Or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled. So basically, regardless of whether she's guilty or not, if a, if a husband becomes jealous of his wife, this is going to be the, the course of action to take in that event. Now, I want to start off just talking about jealousy for a minute because the world today views jealousy and will teach that jealousy is just bad, it's wrong, you shouldn't be a jealous person, you shouldn't be a jealous husband. But the Bible actually talks a lot about jealousy, and God himself is jealous. We go to the first mention of jealousy in Scripture. It's found in Exodus chapter 20 at the giving of the Ten Commandments. There's a very first reference to the word jealous in Scripture, and it's found multiple times in Scripture. If we look at Exodus 20, you could turn there if you'd like. The Bible says in verse number one, and God spake all these words. And I love that, first of all, God spake all these words. You know, we believe the Bible, we believe that God spake all these words. When we go back to the Old Testament, when we go into the New Testament, when we read the Bible, it's God's word. This is why it has authority. This is why we turn to the scriptures and say, hey, thus saith the Lord. Not this is my opinion, not this is just what I think. We go back and we can see, hey, God spake all these words and said, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Commandment one and commandment two of the Ten Commandments have to do with God being number one, God being first. There is no other God. He starts off, number one, hey, there is no other God before me. That is extremely important in the eyes of the Lord that he gets all the credit, that he gets all the attention, all the focus, 
the, 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 the object of your faith, it should be on the Lord, that there is no other God. Verse 4 says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. So number two is you don't make any idols. No idolatry because an idol symbolizes a false god. Right? Another god. He's saying you shouldn't have anything before me. And then he explains why. Why is it that he doesn't want any God before him? Why is it that you can't make any forms of idolatry, that you can't fashion anything that's a likeness of anything in heaven above or in the sea or in the earth? Why? Because God's a jealous God. Now, if that's such a horrible thing for a person to be jealous, maybe you ought to think about God says he's a jealous God. And what does it mean when it says that he's a jealous God? It means he wants your affection. He wants your attention. He wants you focused on him and not on others, not on anything else or anyone else or any other so-called God. He says, no, I'm God. I'm the creator. I'm the almighty. You don't go whoring around and, and go, oh, well, I like this God or I like that God. Look, you don't get to choose. There's one God. And he demands your attention. He demands your obedience. He demands your respect. And he is a jealous God. He says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. It's serious. I mean, he's going intergenerational here. When you, when you hate God, he says, look, I'm a jealous God. You better serve me. Verse number six, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. There's a lot of Christians today that give lip service to the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, just especially the Ten Commandments specifically. Oh, man, we got to get the Ten Commandments back in the courthouse. I say, amen. We got to get the Ten Commandments back in school. We gotta get the Ten... People talk about the Ten Commandments. But then when you want to actually go to the law of God, oh, well, that's the Old Testament. I don't know why you're doing that. It's like, come on, make up your mind. Are we going to... Because in the Ten Commandments, verse number six, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. In keeping his commandments, he's not just talking about the Ten Commandments. He wants us keeping all of his commandments. Another reference to God being called a jealous God is in Exodus 34, 14. The Bible says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. I mean, it's, 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 such, it's so foundational to who God is. He says, My name is Jealous. This is an attribute of the Lord, and you find this from the beginning to the end, when is it that God really gets irate? When is it that God brings judgment? It's when the children of Israel were going and, and serving Baal and, and erecting false you know, altars and the false gods. That's when God gets the most angry. I mean, when is it that a person becomes reprobate? Romans chapter 1 tells us that they, you know, they change the truth of God into a lie. And worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. It says that when you know, they knew God, they glorified him not as God. They became vain in their own imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. This all happened because they're setting up idols. They're making up their own gods. They, don't like, they know who God is, but they don't like him, so they want a different God. That's when God gives up on someone. It's the same way with a nation. When a nation, you know, there's a lot of sin and iniquity that could go on in a nation and God would be very long-suffering and merciful, but once you got the whole nation just going aside to Baal, that's when God brings a judgment. I mean, that's what happened with the children of Israel when it went into captivity. Ultimately, it was because they started going after false gods. And God says, you know what? I'm a jealous God, and now you're going to pay for that. There's nothing wrong with having jealousy, especially when there's something that you, know, you deserve. that God deserves that attention. God deserves that love and that affection. God ought to be the focus of our affection and, and, and all those things. But how about a husband to a wife or a wife to a husband? I mean, should, doesn't, doesn't that demand your love and respect and attention? I mean, shouldn't my wife be bound to love me and have her eyes only set on me and not another man? Isn't that what you vow when you get married? So there's nothing wrong with having a jealous husband because he doesn't want his wife going whoring around with some other guy. But the world's going to tell you, oh, no, he's just jealous. He shouldn't be jealous. I mean, look, this is what the movies are going to teach you. 
All the, the teenage movies and stuff, oh yeah, that guy's just jealous and it's like a bad thing. It's wrong, oh, you shouldn't be jealous. Oh, he's just jealous. I, you, know, he, you, should, you should be allowed to go out and hang around with any guy that you want and go spend a bunch of alone time together and share all your secrets. No, that's not right for a married woman to go out and, and just have some male friend that's not her husband, that she's share, sharing intimate you know, talks with, and, and, and all this focus and attention, look, it's wrong. Amen. It's wicked. Amen. Thank you for the amens because it's starting to get a little quiet in here. Amen. I'm barely getting started. <laughs> Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 6. Jealousy is something you don't want to mess with. Now, now, you may be, you know, it's righteous to be jealous in certain circumstances. It's righteous for God to be jealous when, when people are going after false gods. It's righteous for a husband to be jealous over his wife when she's spending a bunch of inordinate ordinate time with some other man who's getting her attention and devotion instead of him. But it's never a good situation. You never want to be in a situation with someone where the other person's jealous. Because nothing good comes out of that. When God gets jealous, he, hey, you don't want to be the person on the receiving end when God's jealous. And similarly, in a marriage and relationship, you don't want to be on that, you know, in, <laughs> in that relationship, you don't want to be there when a person's jealous because nothing good ever happens when that jealousy is going on. And this is one of the reasons why I think God has this commandment here, this, this, uh, this situation dealing with this in Numbers chapter 5. But look at Proverbs chapter 6. It shows us uh, what we probably already know just by living life through experience. But um, take the word of God here. If you don't already know this, if you've never dealt with this before, as uh, how serious it is to get involved with jealousy and, uh, and to treat it very seriously. Look at verse number 27 in Proverbs chapter 6. The Bible says, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding." He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. So this is comparing someone who is steal a thief, right? Someone steals because they're hungry. You could have some understanding for someone who does that. Now, obviously, they still need to pay. It's not right. It's a sin. They should, they should pay up. You know, you're going to have to pay sevenfold or whatever the case may be because of their sin. But you could understand that. You're not going to be, like, just hating that person and, and just having this this. this necessarily extreme emotion towards someone who steals, even though it's, it's definitely wrong. But when someone comes in and lays with your wife, that's a whole nother story. The Bible says, look, it's going to destroy your own soul. Wound and dishonor shall he get. He's saying he's not very smart, the person who does that. Verse 34 says, for jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom. Neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. He said, you know, when jealousy takes over a man, he's not going to care. He'll be like, oh, yeah, but here, take my money. Here's $5,000. He's not going to care about that at all. Because he'll be enraged that you laid with his wife. Right. And he's not going to rest until vengeance is taken. That's, right. That's why you have crimes that are called you know, a crime of passion. Have you heard of that? Where someone might get murdered. The most common reason for that is because someone finds out that their wife has been unfaithful and they end up killing either their, their spouse or the person that they laid with or both because it enrages a person. And rightfully so. If a husband finds reason, but see, this is why I believe we have this in Numbers chapter 5 because you might have a situation where the husband's getting jealous. He's getting suspicious. He's thinking maybe something's going on with his wife. But there's no witnesses. There's nothing to say, oh, yeah, she's definitely guilty of committing adultery. And this is not a, a, a healthy place to be if you have this suspicion going on because you're going to have a lot of problems then going on in that marriage 
when you've got that jealousy going on, right? Because you're uncertain, you're seeing things, but you're just not quite sure. And God puts this in the Bible to help deal with this issue. And there's guaranteed to be many problems until you can get that issue resolved. Look at verse, go back to Numbers chapter 5. We're going to pick up in verse number 15. The Bible says, Then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part of an ephah of barley meal. He shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon. For it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, and of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall take and put it into the water. And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and uncover the woman's head and put the offering of memorial in her hands, which is a jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causeth the curse. So we're going to pause here. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because the Bible says here that he's going to uncover the woman's head. Now, from other, looking at other passages in Scripture, you can understand what this means. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. When the Bible talks about uncovering someone's hair, it's talking about not having hair. When it covers uncovering their head, it's not talking about taking off a hat. Okay, it's, we, don't, we don't believe in the, in the bonnets and the, in the head coverings here. When we read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it's very clear from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it's talking about a, a man's head being covered, talking about his hair, a woman's head being covered, talking about her hair. And uh, when it's uncovered, it's because they don't have the hair there to cover it. Verse number 5 of 1 Corinthians 11, the Bible reads, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. And the, going through this process is obviously, it's a, it's, it's a shameful process from the beginning. If, 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 a, if a man is jealous over his wife and there's cause for jealousy, you know, I would say, wives, if you find your husband acting jealous, maybe you should check yourself. Because right. it's usually not going to be causeless. There's usually a reason for that jealousy. And I know where we live in 2022 and, and, you know, the women's rights and all this other stuff, but that's not what the Bible teaches at all. We already, we already went over this. If you've been here since the beginning, hearing the preaching from the other preachers, uh, great subjects, great sermons. But the Bible says in, uh, in, in Proverbs chapter 7, turn there if you'd like, Proverbs chapter 7, Why do I say check yourself? Because I've found that the vast majority of time, when you have a jealous husband, you're usually going to find a loud, obnoxious wife. When you have a, a husband acting jealous, you're usually going to find a loud, stubborn woman on the other side. And that's why. Why? Because she's drawing this attention to herself from a bunch of other guys. You're going to find someone who's immodest. You're going to find somebody who's out there and getting really friendly with a lot of other people. Whether she's committing an act or not, she's going around and doing this stuff. And you know what? It's ungodly and wicked. Yeah, it's wrong. Right, right. The Bible says in Proverbs 7, verse 10, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. And it doesn't even say that this woman was a harlot, but she was dressed like a harlot. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. So there we see some characteristics of this woman who goes out and just finds some random guy, this simple man who's walking by and just you know, entices him to come and lay with her and just commit sin. And this, these are the attributes of a woman like that. She's dressing like a hooker and she's loud and stubborn and her feet don't abide at home. And so she's given plenty of opportunity if she's married for her husband to start thinking and getting jealous, but hey, what's going on? But what does people run with? Oh, well, you should, you should just trust me more. Look, it has nothing to do with trust. It has to do with people, you know, take, you know, take heed lest you fall. It has to do with being wise. It has to do with not just even all that, but how about the woman, you know, caring about his, her husband enough to make sure that she could avoid even the appearance of evil. Amen. 
Flip over, you're in Proverbs 7, just flip over to the last proverb, Proverbs 31, we see the virtuous woman. You know, a virtuous woman's not going to provoke her husband to jealousy. Proverbs 31, verse 10, the Bible reads, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. And you continue on reading there, it's going to give you a lot more attributes of the hardworking, virtuous woman. You know where her place is? At home. Amen. She's taking care of her household. She's making sure they're fed and clothed and that all their needs are being met at home. Amen. She's not wandering about house to house, being idle, tattler, busybody, loud, obnoxious, stubborn. Amen. Of course, this is the opposite of the modern masculist movement today. It's not feminist. It's masculist. It's a misnomer. I mean, they're trying to make women more like men. The feminist movement is trying to make women like men. That's why it's masculist. They're trying to make women more masculine by saying, go out and get a job. Provide for your family. Go work. Uh, that's, that's the masculine thing to do. Well, you can't, you're not equal unless you do everything a man does. So you just want women to be more like men? How about women be more like women and men be more like men? Amen. We have enough problem with, with the men being pansies and becoming too feminine these days. And men, step it up because you don't need the women becoming more masculine. It's the last thing you need. Let's go back to Numbers chapter 5 if you would. Not a good place to be when you've got a jeal jealousy going on. But God, thankfully, provided a, a way to deal with this. And I, 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 this is an amazing you know, chapter, and I'm sure I'm barely even scratching the surface as we get into this. There's a lot more meaning behind this. Um, because this is one of those things that I believe is just it's supernatural. The way that the judgment takes place. Because what, what do they end up doing? They put some dirt into the water, and then the woman has to drink the water. Right? Now, it's not magic dirt. Right? There's not, there's not any hocus pocus going on. But it is, it does cause a curse that comes from the Lord. Because in this situation, nobody knows the truth other than, you know, if there was an act that went on, the people that were involved. Because no, there's no other witnesses, no one knows about this, but God knows the truth. And this is actually a way, if the husband was jealous without cause, without, without a justified reason, you know, without there actually being an act committed, this is a great opportunity to set that marriage then back, he could have his mind settled then. And then he doesn't have to have that same jealousy. It could be settled and done and water under the bridge. But you know what? It's also an opportunity for women not to think that, hey, you could just get, around, get away with, with um, committing adultery. Because there's still, even if you say, well, we're, no one's ever going to, no one saw, no one's going to say anything. Well, there still is a curse for that. There still is repercussion. Let's read this. Let's keep reading this chapter. Verse number 19, the Bible says, And the priest shall charge her by an oath and say unto the woman, If no man have lain with thee, and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man have lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse. And an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. This is how God feels about adultery. Okay, first of all, as I mentioned before, adultery carries a death penalty sentence. But in, in, in the law, in the government, there has to be witnesses in order to put people to death. Right, And this just further proves that, that God's not commanding people to take the law into their own hands and just go, well, I just know this person committed adultery, so I'm just going to go and kill him. No. If that were the case, then this wouldn't even make sense. This wouldn't have to be in the law at all. This is in here because there's, there's many cases, there could be many cases where you don't know, you don't have the witnesses to prove it, so you're going to have to rely on God's judgment to, uh, to come through in the end. 
But since God feels very, very passionately about adultery and about the unfaithfulness, that he added this to make sure that that wouldn't happen because it is, I think it's one of the worst sins that people could commit. The sin of adultery. And look, I know this, we're, in, we're living in a dark, sinful, adulterous generation. We need to get our minds reset to how God would have us thinking about this. Because you have the whole the world around you. Adultery is not a big deal. These days, it doesn't even matter. You see it on the TV shows, on the movies. I mean, it's just a normal thing. Oh, we just had an affair. And maybe I'll get divorced. Who cares? Doesn't matter. It's real easy to do these days, even in the court system. I just go down, get a divorce. Just got married last week, get a divorce. It's like an enhanced dating. <laughs> Instead of an oath before the Lord. Leviticus 20.10 says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Amen. That's how God feels about adultery. Right. Hebrews 13.4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Amen. Amen. It doesn't matter, Old Testament, New Testament, you know, the unfaithfulness, it's a big deal. And on top of all that, God adds Numbers chapter 5 saying, hey, look, if you can't convict somebody on this, there's still going to be a curse associated with committing adultery. You're not going to get away guiltless. Back to Numbers 5, look at verse number 22. The Bible says, and this water that causes the curse shall go into thy bowels to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, amen, amen. And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. And he shall cause a woman to drink the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. And, and this is really interesting. It mentions this about the, the curses being written, and he takes water and then blots them out. And this is a way, I think, of finalizing, hey, all the, the sins are going to be brought up. It's for a memorial, for a remembrance of sin. He's going to say, if this is true, if this thing been done, then she's going to be cursed. But if not, then you know what? The curses are gone. They're wiped away as well. It's going to finally settle this in that event so that the husband could either be sure, 100%, be like, all right, good. You know, she, she, nothing happened. And just put the past behind you and move forward. And uh, if, if there was something that happened, then you know that, uh, that those curses are going to enter into the woman and, uh, and she's going to be cursed as a result. The Bible says in verse number 25, Then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hand and shall wave the offering before the Lord and offer it upon the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the offering, even the memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar. And afterward shall cause the woman to drink the water. And when he hath made her to drink the water, then it shall come to pass that if she be defiled and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter, and her belly shall swell, and her thigh shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. So when this happens, people are going to see and notice. How are they going to notice? Why? One, because her belly is going to swell. And I want you to make note of that too. Her belly wasn't swollen before. Her belly is going to swell if she did this thing and commit a curse. And it says that her thigh is going to rot. Now, I don't know exactly the details of what that means, but rotting thighs doesn't sound very good. <laughs> I was thinking about this and kind of looking at this, and I talked to some people, you know, is, could thighs be somewhat euphemistic for another nether region that becomes corrupt and polluted? I think that's a good possibility because if she's, if she's free and not guilty, then it says, hey, she's going to be able to conceive seed and everything's going to be good and it's a curse upon her because she went aside and committed adultery, I think it's a good possibility. But either way, the rotting, you think about rotting flesh, it's not a good, you know, whatever it is, it's not good, okay? It's going to cause you to be a curse among the people. It's something that's going to be well known and people are going to be able to identify you and be like, yeah, that's, you know, that woman was unfaithful. The Bible says in verse number 28, if the woman be not defiled but be clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. This is the law of jealousies when a wife goeth aside to another instead of her husband and is defiled, 
Or when the spirit of jealousy cometh upon him, and he be jealous over his wife, and shall set the woman before the Lord, and the priest shall execute upon her all this law. Then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity, and this woman shall bear her iniquity. Now, one of the reasons why I even brought this up, why are you preaching this at the Red Hot Pastor Burzens? And I wanted to take the time to go through Numbers chapter 5 and kind of go through this whole thing so we can kind of look at it from, I would say, the normal standpoint, the standpoint of a Bible believer looking at the Bible, understanding what it says on its surface, very clear, right? What it says versus what it doesn't say. The reason why is because I actually heard about this from one of my church members actually brought this up to me. And he said that there's some people out there that are trying to use this passage to justify abortions. So people heard that? Yes? All right. <laughs> it's not, it's, I, I didn't know about this until it was brought up to me. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Because how could you possibly turn to this and say, how does that justify abortion? You know, we start bringing it up. I'm just like, what? What? But there's a reason why, and you know, it's from the same crowd, the same group of people that are not Christians, that don't believe the Bible, but they want to tell you what the Bible says, right? right? The, one, the ones that never read the Bible, but they go to their one atheist blog post and they copy and paste, right? The same things over and over again, like about the shellfish, right? And about the mixed fabric, you know, all the things that you just get the same exact post over and over again. Because none of them actually read, none of them actually look it up for themselves. They just repeat what they've heard. But they're going to tell you how to be a Christian. But here's the reason why, I, where I think this even comes from. Oh, this is definitely where it comes. Not just what I think. This is definitely where this comes from. It comes from the NIV. It comes from the NIV. It doesn't come, we, we didn't see anywhere in here anything about abortion or baby dying or anything like that. Not once in God's holy word. I'm going to read for you what the NIV says, and, and then you'll, you'll, you'll become real clear. So the NIV says, I can't, you can't even call it the Bible. The NIV says this, starting in their verse number 16, and you can look down at, your, at the Bible in Numbers chapter 5, because just look at all the differences too as we read through, as I read out loud, the NIV, even though there's, like, there's a lot of differences and some of them are synonyms, even the feel and the understanding of the passage using different words that might be kind of close, it still just gives off a different understanding than what the scripture is showing here in the King James Bible. And, and, and you'll see that as soon as I start reading. Follow along, starting in verse 16. Here's what the NIV says. The priest shall bring her and have her stand before the Lord. Then he shall take some holy water in a clay jar and put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. Verse 18, after the priest has had the woman stand before the Lord, he shall loosen her hair and place in her hands a reminder offering. Now, loosen her hair, is that the same as, as un, you know, uncovering? No, it's, not. it's not. I mean, not, not according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for sure. But what would be, the, I mean, what if the, what if the woman's hair wasn't, uh, what, what was already loose, right? <laughs> uh, loosen her hair, like, like it's not up in a bun or something to, to take out. He's going to loosen her hair and place in her hand. See, the reason why the, the uncovering of the head is there is because it's a shame. That's why it's there to begin with. Loosening her hair doesn't mean anything, but this is just what you get. This is what happens when you have a bunch of unsaved people trying to put their interpretation behind what the scripture says. And place in her hands the reminder offering, the grain offering for jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water that brings a curse. Verse 19, then the priest shall put the woman under oath and say to her, if no other man has had sexual relations with you and you have not gone astray and become impure while married to your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. But if you have gone astray while married to your husband and you have made yourself impure by having sexual relations with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the woman under this curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people. And here's the key. When he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. May this water that brings a curse enter 
your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. It, it, it's not even consistent with your, with the, with, within itself. Verse 21 says, when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. Verse 22 says, so that it curse enter in your body, your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. Well, which is it? Is it both or is it either or? This is why you got to toss that trash in the garbage. Amen. It's not the word of God. The NIV, it, it causes confusion. Yea, it's a, it's a tool of the devil. Because people who don't know any better can look at this and be like, well, wow, yeah, I mean, I guess if a woman commits adultery, then there's a cause for her to have abortion. I mean, it's sanctioned by the priest, right? Sanctioned by the Lord. He's given her a curse and a bit of water, and that's just going to make her miscarry the child that was conceived through adultery. But that's not what the Bible teaches at all. Because it's not justified. In fact, in the story, if you remember, her body, her, she doesn't swell until after the curse. It's not like she's already conceived and already has a child. If she already conceived, then how is she going to be able to conceive seed? It makes no sense. And again, you know, I have the rest of this here. I'm not going to read all of it, but it continues on. It says her abdomen will swell and her womb will miscarry. It says it like three times in this passage that she's going to miscarry as a result. There's one other argument that I want to cover that the baby murderers want to use to try to say, oh, the Bible endorses abortion. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? To those of us who are saved, it's ridiculous. But you know what? you got to be aware that it's out there. And the other reason why I wanted to bring it up is because Numbers chapter 5 is kind of an obscure passage. And when it's talking about this, you know, a lot of people might have read over this. I'm sure you know, many people are familiar with the passages in general. Like, oh, yeah, that's the one where the you know, her thigh rots or something. You know, and you kind of remember that. But it can catch you off guard. And most false doctrines and bad teachings are found in the more obscure passages. And it's all the more reason to understand what does it actually mean and what is it actually saying so that you're not just caught off guard. So you could be a, a, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth and understanding, well, what does that passage? Oh, yeah, I know that passage. I know exactly what that's talking about. So I spent more time talking about, you know, what does the passage actually mean? And I'm just taking that surface value there for what it was saying and then covering these, these wicked, false uh, uh, accusations of what the Bible is saying here through a false version. The other, another argument that they use is just say, well, the Bible doesn't talk about it at all. Uh, how about, you know, thou shalt not kill? How about just the fact that women who are pregnant are more often than not referred to women with child? When you're with child, like I have six children in the back, and if there's a child in a womb, that's still a child. They have just as much right to life as any other child has. So God doesn't have to specifically mention and go into detail about the graphics of what's involved in killing a child inside of the womb in order for us to understand that that's wicked and wrong. He just refers to people who are with child. And by the way, Mary was referred to as being with child when she conceived seed. So going all the way back to conception, she was with child. That's when it starts. They use this other, um, and this is another bizarre one. Turn if you go to Exodus chapter 21. This other argument that try to justify baby murder. And it's not, again, it's not much of a surprise. When you have a bunch of unsaved people trying to tell you what the Bible means, it just gets so weird, though. Because this is actually a passage that I would use to support the Bible teaching that uh, someone who's guilty of killing a child inside of the womb would be guilty of the death penalty. And they try to use the same passage to teach that it's somehow it's okay. Exodus 21, look at verse number 22. The Bible says, if men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as a woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So what they, they, they stop right here and they'll say, oh, well, look, I mean, if, uh, 
you know, if there's men, basically it was men fighting and there's a woman around and somehow she gets, they, they knock into her, they punch her, somehow she gets injured to the point where her fruit departs from her, right? She loses the baby. Then it says, and it says, yet no mischief follow. He shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him. And they say, see, look, if a baby dies there, then it's just a fine. No big deal. It's like, well, wait a minute. First of all, it's wrong. But second of all, it's not just a fine because you got to keep reading. It says, it, there's a second condition there. It says, and if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Amen. So the key in understanding this is, well, what does it mean when the mischief follow? That has to do with the intent. Yep. Because if it was a total accident and a woman gets injured and loses the baby, obviously that's still wrong and it should never happen. But it's a similar situation that the Bible gives when someone's guilty of committing manslaughter. That's a common term that we know it as today. The Bible refers to that as the slayer, which is real easy to remember. I mean, manslaughter, manslayer, it's basically the same thing. When someone dies unintentionally, it's an accident. I mean, look, these things happen. People lose their lives, unfortunately, due to accidents. It does, the person who, who is responsible for the accident is still not held guiltless. There still is a punishment for it, but it's not the same uh, uh, punishment. It's not the same judgment as someone who willfully murders somebody. Right. As someone who lies in wait and goes in and says, you know, I'm going to kill this guy. Right. Two different punishments. I'm going to read for you from Deuteronomy chapter 19, just, just clearly from Scripture saying uh, regarding this matter, and this is the case of the slayer which shall flee thither, that he may live. Whoso killeth his neighbor ignorantly whom he hated not in time past, as when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor to hew wood, and his hand fetcheth the stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slippeth from the helve and lighteth upon his neighbor that he die, he shall flee unto one of those cities and live. So you're saying two guys are going out, so you're cutting down trees, and then you know, the axe head flies off and hits this other guy, and he dies. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an accident. He didn't hate him. He wasn't going out in the woods to try to, to, to murder him or anything like that. He says, look, he needs to go into one of these cities of refuge, and then he's going to live. But one of the conditions was, you've got to stay in that city of refuge. You can't leave. Because the family of that person who died is going to be pretty upset that they died. And they might want to blame you for that happening and, and, you know, and want to kill you as a result. But God's judgment says, nope, they're going to live. It's the same matter with the unborn child. Saying, you know what? They're, if, if that happens, there's going to be a person that's punished. But hey, if it, if it wasn't intentional, if there's no mischief involved, it wasn't... So, and when you look up the word mischief too, you can see it's people who are planning evil intent. Just look how it's used in scripture, that mischief. It makes sense. And then it says, then shalt, shalt thou give life for life. So when a person intentionally goes in and kills a baby in the womb, that's intentional. Right. And the Bible says you should give life for life. Amen. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. You know, these abortion doctors that go in and chop up little babies into pieces, you know what? They ought to be chopped up into little pieces. And if the baby survives the abortion, then you know what? You got to maim the person who did that to the same degree. And that's righteousness, and that's righteous judgment according to the word of God. Amen. And if we had righteous laws in this land, that's what would be done. It would be life for life because there's life inside of that womb. It's not just some blob of tissue. It's not just a fetus. It's not just some other name that you want to give it to try to dehumanize it. It's a person. It's ridiculous. Turn it real quick to, to Deuteronomy 22. I was going to throw this in if I had a little bit of time. I've got just a little bit of time. And I don't know what's so hard to understand about this. You know, the Bible is, is following the commandments, the, the commandments of the Lord. Like, the world thinks you're nuts today if you want to go back and, and, and ha institute the laws of the Old Testament. And I'm talking about the laws of Old Testament. I'm not talking about the Levitical laws of, of you know, sacrificing lambs and animals and stuff like that. 
We're talking about the moral laws. We're talking about the things that, that are pretty common sense, actually. That's something that, that God has also instilled in us through our conscience of just having an understanding of justice and right and wrong. But there's a, the, the laws I brought up, you know, from Leviticus 20, yes, I believe in the death penalty for adultery. Amen. Yes, that is a righteous judgment. Right. You know, the, 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 the alphabet animal group out there, they want to, yeah, I call them alphabet. I mean, it's funny, my kids have a video, they watch the alphabet animals. But I got a whole new meaning for alphabet animals. Theirs is like an ABC thing. This one's an LGB thing. There's alphabet animals out there. That want to say, oh yeah, well why don't you, why don't you preach on uh, you know death penalty for this? You know what I do? Right. I'm doing it right now tonight. I'm preaching on death penalty for adulterers because it's wicked as hell, Amen. and it's something that ought not to be tolerated. Just like you ought not to tolerate perversion. Right. They're both w uh, worthy of death. Yep. And yes, the 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 the. The, the uh, son or daughter that's going to curse their father or mother, they ought to be put to death too. Amen. 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 Yeah, you know, yes, the Amen. person who curses their father or mother ought to be put to death too. Amen. I do believe the Bible. I believe every word that's written in it. Amen. And I believe that God's law is perfect and righteous. And that may sound shocking to some, but, you know, check yourself. Don't stand in judgment of the word of God. If that makes you uncomfortable, go back and read the scripture and be like, you know, if you find something that says, well, that can't be true, you know what, maybe you've been brainwashed by the world into thinking that can't be true or can't be right. You get desensitized, and you do get desensitized. I remember the first time coming in, and, and you know, I first started going to Faith Ward Baptist Church, hearing the preaching against the sodomites, the homos, the queers, going like, whoa. <laughs> you don't hear that every day. But, but you know what? It was good. I remember, I remember specifically, you know, talking to Bezra Anderson and saying, you know, man, he's like, I, I was like, don't ever stop <laughs> preaching this. So don't ever stop. Because while it is kind of shocking when, when you're getting your head out of the world and you're living in the world and you're just being inundated day after day after day with the media and the music and everything else and teaching you that, oh, just let them be, oh, just let them do their thing. Because look, I grew up through the eras, just in, in recent history, the past four decades, I came, you know, we we're talking with Pastor Jones uh, at the pastor's luncheon, talking about how things used to be. And of course, as Pastor Mejia doesn't ever let me forget <laughs> about the, the sermon that I preached <laughs> right before his, his building got bombed, which look, Hey, I, I didn't start it. Those protesters were there before I ever came, okay? So you can't pin that on me. But the era, I lived in the era where calling someone a fag was fighting words. And not because, oh, you could hurt somebody's feelings. Not because, oh, the, the poor little fag's going to be offended. It's because, don't you call me that because that's repulsive and abominable and filthy and you know it's like, don't call me a dog right. Right. I lived through that and I've seen through the world through the television the the desensitizing of the fags on the TV screen because they started off as a joke it started off as a the comic relief right the the, the flaming funny guy that could just be the butt of jokes introduced on the TV screen. Oh, yeah, it was real funny. Like the, the, the guy on MASH. For, I mean, that's going way back. That would dress, cross-dress. Oh, but it was funny and it was okay because he's trying to get out of the army. That's how they sell it. That's how they sold it to people back then who never would have tolerated. The culture never would have tolerated what's the filth that's going on today. They had to ease you into it. And I, I'm unique in a sense that I went through so much of that and have seen the change in a short period of time in general. I mean, I, I think it's a short period of time to go from one extreme to the other. To literally go from, from as a kid, you know, you, you call someone a fag, it's fighting words. Now it's fighting words for the exact opposite reason. Now it's you're going to get canceled because you said that word. It's ridiculous. How'd I get off on that tangent? Deuteronomy 22. 
And I'm just going to point this out because you had that, that Numbers chapter 5 in the NIV, totally different. Okay, the Bible that you read matters. Yeah. It matters because it teaches crazy things. And there's one more crazy thing that, that the NIV teaches that's not found in Scripture that brings a reproach on the name of Christ. Because people try to claim that the Bible says these things when the Bible does not say these things is found in Deuteronomy 22, where the NIV actually teaches that a woman has to marry her rapist. Deuteronomy 22, look at verse 23. The Bible says, If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in a city and lie with her, then he shall bring them both out unto the gate of the city, of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. So this is someone that's committing adultery. People who are committing adultery. And you're saying, you know that she wasn't forced? Because she's in the city, there's plenty of people around, but she didn't cry out for help. There's, she, didn't, she didn't try at all to have anyone save her, rescue her, to, to know that it was non-consensual. So he says, okay, you find someone like that, put him to death. That's adultery. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her, and these words are all important. So now we have someone being forced and lie with her. Then the man only that lay with her shall die. So the person who forces another person, the Bible says they're put to death. It says, but unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There isn't a damsel no sin worthy of death, for as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. Saying, the woman didn't do anything wrong. She gets forced. That's, she didn't do anything wrong. The man did, though. He needs to be put to death. And you know what? Amen. Yeah. Rapists ought to be put to death. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I believe that, too. Yeah. For he found her in the field, and the patrol damsel cried, and there was none to save her. Verse 28. So here's another situation. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and, you know, these conditions, the first two is talking about people who are uh, betrothed, to be married, right? They're taken or spoken for. They're espoused. But then you see someone who's not, right? So this would not fall under the category of adultery. It says, and lay hold on her and lie with her and they be found. Then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver and she shall be his wife because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. Now, why in the world would somebody, just because they're betrothed to someone, oh yeah, man, if, if someone forces her, then he needs to be put to death. But if she's not betrothed and someone forces a woman, oh, well, then, then you just marry her. Because that's what the NIV says. It makes no sense right. at all. I mean, for anyone who has any common sense and can use judgment at all, it makes no sense. But yet, that's what the NIV says. The NIV says in verse 28, if a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and rapes her and they are discovered, he shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver. He must marry the young woman for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives. And you're going to claim that's judgment from God? Yeah, just go ahead and rape someone and then you have to marry her. So a man can find a woman that doesn't want to marry him and then just rape her. Oh, now you have to marry me. And you know what? I can't divorce you, so you're stuck with me for the rest of your life. That's not the word of God. Amen. And look, if you, if you know someone that uses an NIV, show them this passage and show them what garbage that is. And don't get confused by the King James when it says that... Uh, uh, he lay hold on her because that's not the same thing as forcing. If you're going to lay with someone, you're going to lay hold. I mean, it's, it's, just gonna, it's, it's kind of natural it's going to happen. You're going to have to take hold. No, the NIV likes to say, the unsaved people who, who are trying to uh, distort the word of God are saying that, it's, that that's rape ridiculous. We need to embrace the Word of God, first of all. Amen. Embrace the Word of God. Embrace the, the obscure passages of the Bible that you might not even understand exactly what they mean, but you know what? 
Just embrace it. It's the Word of God. Don't ever let anyone make you ashamed or embarrassed of the Word of God. Because if you feel embarrassed by the Word of God, you're falling in judgment of God's Word. And that's not a place you want to be. Reject the corrupt NIV out of hand. And, you know, I love, was that Pastor Shelley that does the, bur- the burning? The NIV burning? Amen. Keep it up. Fuel for the fire. It's where it belongs. And you know what? Know your Bible. Don't let these passages get you off guard. And when people say ridiculous things like that, obviously you just, just turn to it. If people say weird things, outlandish things, you're like, I've never even heard that before. Just open up the King James Bible and see what it says. And, um, you know, hopefully you already know what it says. Love the Bible. Defend the Bible. It's the Word of God. It's about right as that word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much um, for all that you uh, can teach us, dear Lord. I pray that you would please... Bless the rest of this uh, conference. I pray that you please bless Pastor Anderson who comes up here to preach your Lord, fill him with your spirit and your power. And God, help us all to go our ways uh, safely this evening when we are dismissed. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.